Even though his choice of speaker for this evening leaves his uh, judgment a little suspect, I want to uh, thank Michael Moore for the work and the enthusiasm which he's put into these uh, Monday seminars. How many of you uh, heard the talk on uh, the whooping cranes a couple of weeks ago? I thought that was really excellent. And I think Susan Pratt here gets uh, a lot of credit for that as well. When Michael asked around a couple of months ago about putting together an event to appeal, to appeal to members interested in the night sky, someone mentioned that I had given some talks at the Alachua County Astronomy Club and at uh, Okamak in Gainesville. And he contacted me and we settled on a date and a topic. And then I contacted our local astronomy couple, Phil Vella and Helen Safranic, and I had a simple request. I said, can you please arrange for a lunar eclipse for um, Monday, February 18th? I gave them a month's notice. Well, the quality of help isn't uh, what it used to be because the best they ate, that they could do was uh, Wednesday evening, uh, uh, night after tomorrow. And uh, in retrospect, it might be uh, uh, the best thing because uh, the, the weather certainly isn't appropriate tonight for uh, viewing an eclipse. Uh, hopefully, uh, Wednesday will be better. So on Wednesday evening, if uh, Phil and Helen come through and nature cooperates with the weather, we'll have a uh, eclipse viewing out on the driving range. Uh, I hope that uh, you'll join us because there really is no substitute for directly experiencing the uh, immensity and the richness of the night sky, even if you can't express it as uh, vividly as Van Gogh uh, here was uh, able to. But that experience can also be enhanced by having a deeper understanding of what's really going on in the sky, how the, how the heavens operate. That's, part, that's the part of astronomy that I find the most interesting. So tonight, let's talk some about why eclipses happen and what we can learn from them and how eclipses set astronomers on a path to determine the dimensions of our world. Well, today everyone knows that a lunar eclipse occurs when the Earth blocks out the sunlight that normally illuminates the moon. But of course, our early forefathers uh, didn't know that. They first had to grasp the basic geometry of the heavens, where the sun and the moon go when we don't see them. And it's not obvious. A and eclipses were an important clue and, la and later an, an important confirmation that they were on the right track. And in fact, standing here on the Earth, it is a little difficult to visualize what's going on in an eclipse. So here we are looking from some remote place in our solar system. Uh, the, the solar system is always flooded with light from the sun, and we can escape this blaze of light by hiding in the Earth's shadow for half a day. Because the sun is much larger than both the Earth and the moon, uh, these bodies always wear a kind of a conical shadow that looks a little like a dunce cap a kind of pyramid of darkness. If that uh, phrase sounds poetic, it's because it comes from the poet Shelley, not from me. This cone always points away from the sun. The drawing is not to scale. If the earth were uh, the size of a human head, the cap would be about a hundred miles long. Well, when the moon is full and it's on the far side of the, uh, it's on the far side of the earth. And uh, that is, it is here, and it can also hide in the Earth's shadow. When the moon is new, things are turned around. It's over here, and the Earth can partially hide in the moon's shadow and produce an eclipse of the sun. But because the moon casts a shadow that's much smaller than the Earth itself, a total solar eclipse at any particular place on the Earth is rare. Total uh, lunar eclipses are pretty common, and in fact, it seems like they might occur every full moon. 
But uh, we know this doesn't happen, and the reason it doesn't is because the plane of the orbit of the moon around the Earth, that is this plane here, is tipped out of the plane that the uh, Earth makes rotating around the Sun by about five degrees. So every month the moon spends about half its time below the Earth's path across the sky, say here, and half above. And so that means that uh, most of the time the full moon slips just above or just below the Earth's shadow, as it does, say, here or here. But two times a year, here and here, the orbital planes uh, intersect in such a way that the conditions are optimal for an eclipse of the moon or an eclipse of the sun, depending upon whether the moon is new or full. Is everybody okay with this uh, figure? This is uh, a small enough group that if you, uh, if, they, uh, if, you if I say something you don't understand, why well, stop and ask. Uh, we're trying to aim for a no astronomer left behind atmosphere uh, here tonight. So on Wednesday night, we'll have a full moon which will briefly pass through the Earth's shadow, like this. Now, since the Earth takes a year to circle the Sun, we would expect that the next good eclipse time would be over here six months later, in late August. And then again, uh, next year in February and August and every succeeding year. So, uh, we have a prediction. Eclipses occur in seasons, and these seasons should occur in February and August. So let's take a look at the historical record to see how that prediction turns out. Here we have a plot of the month of eclipses, January, February, so on through December. And there's the year of the eclipse, starting at 1990 and going to 2010. Future eclipses can be predicted with great accuracy. Nobody can uh, predict what the stock market uh, will do in six months, but Occurrences of eclipses can be predicted uh, to the minute for thousands of years in the future. So here, for example, is the February 2008 lunar eclipse. There was a solar eclipse a little earlier, somewhere on the Earth. Here's, a, here's our lunar eclipse. And sure enough, six months later, here in August, there will be another lunar eclipse. Well, that's good news, just as we predicted. But something's clearly wrong because although there are always two eclipse seasons in a year, uh, the two times are on the average only about 173 days or 5.7 months apart, not six. So every year the eclipse season drifts forward by about 19 days. This accounts for the slope of these lines. It takes 18 years and 11 days for the whole pattern to repeat. Uh, this figure is in error. This is half a repeat distance. This is 9 years. 18 years will be up here. This whole cycle was known to the Greeks who named it. They called it the Saros cycle. But the Greeks learned this from the Babylonians who uh, were attentive to the sky as a culture, and they were great record keepers, and they made pots similar to this 1,500 years before the emergence of the great uh, Greek astronomers. So here's a question. Why are the uh, Greek astronomers given so much more credit than the Babylonians? Well, the Babylonians collected the data. Certainly that's a necessary step. But science involves not just uh, noticing patterns, but in developing some kind of true understanding of them. The Babylonians supposedly decided that some kind of semi-transparent dragon in the sky ate the moon and then spit it out again. The Greek astronomers sought and found natural, not supernatural, uh, explanations. 
and this uh, truer natural understanding gave them new ideas that led to further understanding and we're going to see further examples of that uh, later in the talk. On the other hand, the Babylonian dragon theory led absolutely nowhere. Well, speaking of explanations, uh, what went wrong with our prediction of uh, fixed uh, February-August eclipse seasons? We implicitly assumed, as uh, shown here, that the orientation of the Moon-Earth orbit is unchanging as it uh, moves around the Sun. And this, in fact, would be true if the Moon and the Earth were alone in the solar system. But the interaction of the Moon with the Sun, although it's much smaller than with the Earth because the Sun is so much more distant, is not negligible. And this causes the lunar orbit to wobble like a top. And that in turn causes the line of nodes to uh, creep uh, slowly forward every year. The calculations that prove this statement uh, aren't simple. In physics, often two-body calculations are reasonably easy, but you add a third body and things get much more difficult quickly. It took over a hundred years after Newton set out the general principles of gravitational forces before a French physicist named Laplace was able to do sufficiently accurate calculations to prove the explanation was exactly as I've given it. Napoleon supposedly once asked Laplace why in his four-volume treatise on celestial mechanics he found no mention of God. Laplace's famous reply was, Your Grace, I have no need of that hypothesis. Laplace wasn't, I think, uh, uh, just being irreverent. Yeah, he was doing his job as a scientist, finding natural explanations for natural phenomena. Okay, now we understand eclipses, so let's follow this idea that new understandings provide clues for unraveling more puzzles. Probably first as children and then as parents or grandparents, uh, you've been asked or asked or have been asked question, how far away is the moon? And then, how far away are those stars? Well, to astronomers over the centuries, these were definitely not idle questions. The correct answer to these straightforward questions represented uh, always enormous steps toward the understanding of our universe. So, let's spend some time talking about how these kind of questions are answered. Many people were involved in developing the answers, but there are three uh, people in particular that we'll talk about. Eratosthenes, Friedrich Bessel, and Henrietta Leavitt, working, uh, who worked out uh, respectively the distance to the moon, the distance to the nearest stars, and the distance to the nearest galaxies. Okay, first the distance to the moon. We're going to follow the reasoning made in about 200 BC by Eratosthenes. He was a great uh, Greek astronomer who lived and worked in Alexandria in present-day Egypt. And he was also, at that time, the director of the greatest library in the world, in Alexandria. But Eratosthenes is most famous for having first uh, deduced the size of the Earth. I'll give you just a hint as to how he managed that. Um, Tampa is about due south of Lakanto, so knowing the distance and the change in latitude between them, we can calculate the circumference of the Earth. I'll leave that as an exercise uh, for you to uh, uh, think about at the end of the talk if you want some further hints about uh, how to think about that, why um, we can revisit it. Now. Eratosthenes used as his two cities, Alexandria and Aswan, present-day Aswan in Egypt. And since there were no GPS satellites in those days, uh, he measured latitude the old-fashioned way. He measured the length of shadows cast at midday. But even though his methods were uh, crude by uh, today's standards, his reasoning was impeccable. And the diameter that he deduced, about 8,000 miles, was correct to about 2%. But that was just the first step in the program of finding the distance to the moon. 
But he realized then that he could use his new information about the size of the Earth to discover the size of the Moon. That's uh, step two in our program. And you can repeat uh, his experiment on Wednesday night. First you measure the time for the Moon to move across the entire shadow of the Earth. That is, uh, from the beginning to the end of the total eclipse. So the time that it takes for, for the Moon first just to clip, begin to clip the, the shadow and then to barely emerge. That's about 210 minutes if the Moon moves across the central part of the shadow, which it doesn't always do. Now you find the time for the Moon to move uh, across just the edge of the Earth's shadow, say from this position to that position. That's about 70 minutes. So it should be clear that if we forget, as I've done here, the conical shape of the shadow, which is a, a minor correction, the ratio of these two numbers, 70 and 210, <coughs> is just the ratio of the size of the Moon to that of the Earth, the diameter of the Moon to the Earth. So the diameter of the Moon is about a third of that of the Earth, or about 2,700 miles. True diameter, incidentally, is uh, about 2,160 miles. So you got it pretty close. The third step is to use the size of the Moon to determine the distance from its, its distance from the Earth. And that's extremely easy. When you look at the Moon, you can just block out the image with your pinky finger held at about arm's length. And that works out to be an angle of about half a degree. Uh, just as an aside, rather than miles, astronomers measure distances in a lot of uh, different funny ways, light years and parsecs and uh, other um, strange uh, units that are hard to appreciate. Tonight we're going to use a, a much simpler astronomical distance measure with the pinky. And we'll return to it uh, again. So imagine a triangle formed by light from the moon coming into your eye. If you know the length of the base of the triangle is 2,700 miles, and if you know the opposite angle is a half a degree, then it's just a matter of simple geometry to calculate the height of the triangle. And if the Greeks knew anything, they knew geometry. This distance works out to be about 100 times the lunar diameter, or about 300,000 miles. Notice that this is a bootstrap kind of operation. We use a known nearby a distance to work out a larger one. So Eratosthenes used the distance from Alexandria to Aswan to work out successively the size of the Earth, then the size of the Moon, and finally the distance to the Moon. We'll see that this is a pattern uh, uh, that repeats. So, Eratosthenes' grandkids' next question was, Grandpa, how far away are the stars? And here he is, he's the leading astronomer of his time, but he didn't know the answer. And no one else did either, for about 18 more centuries. So that's our next task. The most straightforward way is again by triangulation. If you look at your uh, uh, extended finger, first closing one eye and then the other, uh, your finger position appears to shift against the distant background. The technical name for this effect is parallax. And this figure shows this principle applied on an astronomical scale. As we revolve around the Sun, our position relative to the distant stars changes. So if we take a picture with our left eye, so to speak, today, from here, and then again with our right eye six months later, uh, the stars should appear to shift with respect, nearby stars should appear to shift uh, with respect to the very distant ones. So uh, if, if the pattern looks like this now, and looks like this later, why you, why you can deduce that this uh, star is nearer than the background ones and has moved uh, uh, from this position over to this position. Well, here again is an isosceles triangle uh, with a base that's now equal to twice the distance of the Sun. 
So again, if we measure the angular shift using, uh, we can use trigonometry to find the distance to the nearby star. Well, this principle, which has been used uh, by centuries, for centuries by surveyors, uh, is very simple, but applied to the stars, there's a simple practical problem, which is that the base of the triangle is, as we'll see, very, very small compared to the distance to any star. And that makes uh, this angle uh, that they have to measure very, very small. But of course, at the beginning, astronomers didn't know that. So from Galileo's time, about eight generations of astronomers trained their telescopes on the sky, looking for this telltale annual shift of a star with respect to its background, and they failed. Incidentally, why did I bring up Galileo here? Does anyone know how Galileo entered into this discussion? What's Galileo famous for? Well, in this context, he's most famous for having been the first person to look at the skies with a telescope. So astronomers failed, and then they built more refined telescopes, and they measured some more, and they failed again. By the end of the 1700s, um, that is 150 years after Galileo, all the bright stars, which were presumed to be the nearest ones, had been studied for parallax, and there had been several false alarms, but no verified shifts. And as these uh, failures mounted, it became an embarrassment, and an international competition was announced. And the Prussians, who were very proud of their precision uh, instrument capability, were uh, very keen to win this prize, and they commissioned a new state-of-the-art observatory to be built in Königsberg. And to lead the enterprise, they chose a 26-year-old self-taught prodigy whose name was Friedrich Bessel. Bessel left school at uh, age 14 to become a, an apprentice to an import-export firm in his native port city of Bremen. Talking with sailors about navigation at sea piqued his interest in astronomy. And at 19, uh, entirely by himself, with no training in uh, formal training in higher mathematics, he developed a way of determining mathematically the orbit of Halley's Comet, which was a forefront problem at that time, because Halley's Comet takes a very long, loopy orbit that uh, no one had suspected. Well, that made him famous in some circles, and seven years later, still with no uh, formal university degree, he was chosen to head Prussia's effort to measure the distance to the stars. And it was a really a brilliant choice because Bessel came to this problem with fresh eyes. He wasn't convinced that the brightest stars were necessarily the closest ones. But how then from thousands of stars in the sky do you choose which ones to study? While he was waiting for his new observatory to be built, he set up a program to measure the position in of stars and compare them with measurements that were made a hundred uh, years earlier. And he discovered that over long periods of time, a few star positions were steadily drifting relative to their neighbors. And he reasoned that if stars were wandering around the sky, this motion should be largest and thus most easily detected in the nearby stars. So when his new observatory was completed, Bessel concentrated on measuring the parallax, not of the brightest stars, but of a handful of these odd wandering stars. Well, Bessel was smart and meticulous and very well financed, but for 20 years he too failed to measure a reproducible parallax. The king of uh, Prussia was growing an impatient, but Bessel was a very determined man and he finally put all his accumulated experience into a new instrument uh, specifically designed for his final assault on the problem and it paid off. In 1831, Bessel reported the parallax of a nearby star, a star in the constellation of the Swan, Cygnus. This star is so dim that it is barely visible to the naked eye, and it required measuring a difference in angle of six-tenths of an arc second. Well, there's one of those funny units again. How big is six-tenths of an arc second? Well, it's the width of your pinky if your arm is ten miles long. 10 miles long. So this was a terrific uh, tour de force. No one who uh, understood the care and the precision of Bessel's study could doubt his result, but the message is still, uh, uh, to this day, uh, very hard to truly comprehend. Not 
just for lay persons like ourselves, but even for astronomers. Astronomers have gotten used to the idea, but it's still really hard to comprehend this large distance. The distance to the sun is 300 times further than the distance to the moon. But the next closest star, which is uh, uh, Alpha Centauri, is a quarter of a million times more distant than that. So if the sun was shrunk to the size of a golf ball here in this room, Alpha Centauri would be another golf ball in New York City. And in between, there's almost perfect emptiness. As uh, Carl Sagan uh, once put it, in the universe, the rule is nothing. Something, anything, is the exception. So why is it that there's so much space in the universe and so little stuff to put into it? Up until about 40 years ago, uh, the only answer was simply, well, that's the way it is. But today we have a more sophisticated view. We know that briefly in the early universe, there was in fact a great deal of stuff. Enough matter to make plenty of stars and planets and plants and animals from. But the catch was there was also an almost equal amount of antimatter. And mostly the matter and the antimatter are annihilated with one another. And so today the question is different. It is, why was there any matter left over at all? Why was there a tiny bit more matter than antimatter? And although physicists have several plausible ideas, there's no shortage of ideas, no one knows which one is right, and so consequently no one knows for sure the answer to this question. But that's often the nature of uh, scientific uh, progress. The answer to one question leads to another one at a uh, deeper, more profound level. Well, today grade school children learn that the Milky Way contains billions of stars and that there are also billions of other galaxies. But uh, uh, as little as 80 years ago, large telescopes had just discovered that the sky contained not only individual stars, but was dotted with hazy smudges and whirlpools of light. And were these uh, objects luminous clouds of some kind within our galaxy, or were they independent new galaxies? No one knew, and without this kind of knowledge, it was impossible to place these objects into any kind of a coherent model of the universe. Well, if all stars were equally luminous, measuring their distance would be easy, because the apparent brightness falls off as the square of the distance from the observer. So, so if a star appeared, uh, say, a hundred times dimmer than Bessel's star, it would be ten times further away, and so on. But of course, Bessel showed that you can't judge the distance from brightness alone because some stars are thousands of times uh, more luminous than others. But still, this idea of a standard candle that was uh, bright enough to be seen in distant nebulae were so powerful that astronomers ever since Bessel devoted a lot of effort into trying to make this idea work. And the person that succeeded was Henrietta Leavitt. To understand her contribution, we need to backtrack and talk a little bit about variable stars. Our sun is a typical star, and it produces a steady output of energy that's varied by oh, less than a tenth of a percent over the last 2,000 years. But for a small fraction of stars, the energy output varies by 10% or 100% or more in a pattern that regularly repeats itself with periods that range from minutes to uh, years. Before the days of uh, photography, spotting uh, changes in the brightness of a star was a very subtle business. By the late 1700s, about 20 examples of variable stars were known. The most skillful uh, uh, variable star spotter was a teenage English amateur named John Goodrich, who, although he had lost his hearing due to childhood illness, was gifted with wonderful eyesight. And his careful naked eye observations of the timing and the shape of light curves of these strange stars uh, established variable star watching as a serious science rather than a uh, curiosity. Goodrich showed that some stars, uh, called 
uh, eclipsing binaries change intensity because a dim star circles uh, in front of a brighter one, as shown here. There's a bright uh, white star and a dim yellow star, and the yellow star periodically uh, uh, blots out the light from the uh, stronger one. But the majority of variable stars are more interesting than that. They're, they are single stars that change their intensity by pulsating. They grow periodically larger and then they collapse, big collapse. Stars work by burning hydrogen into uh, a helium. And when the uh, hydrogen runs low, they begin to behave in this, uh, for a time in this strange uh, periodic way. Well, John Goodrick died of pneumonia at age 21 in 18, uh, sorry, 1786, but 100 years later, photographic plates had uh, replaced the human eye for serious astronomical uh, studies. And measuring the position and the brightness of star fields suddenly became much easier. Thousands of star positions and intensities could be recorded on a single photographic plate. And the leading center for this activity was Harvard College Observatory, which is still located just a few blocks from Harvard Square in Cambridge. The sheer volume of new data that was accumulated at Harvard Observatory in those days was staggering. Uh, it was tedious, unromantic work. All night astronomers uh, manned the telescopes, keeping them pointed at the correct star fields. And then during the day, a task force of women would develop the plates and carefully measure the position and the intensity of the star images that were recorded on them. One of these ladies was Henrietta Leavitt, who by a strange coincidence also went deaf in midlife. Leavitt began working as an unpaid volunteer, but after a few years she was hired at the grand salary of 25 cents an hour. And she developed a specialty for identifying variable stars. Over a 30-year career she identified more than 2,400 of them. Um, Harvard College had also set up a small observatory in Arequipa, Peru to study the uh, southern sky that's not visible from Cambridge. And the most spectacular objects in the southern sky are two giant clouds of stars called the Large and the Small Magellanic Cloud, shown here. In fact, this is one of the plates that was made from, or taken at, uh, 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 at the Harvard Observatory. Well, Levitt became particularly interested in a type of pulsating star with a peculiar sawtooth-like variation in its light output that makes it easy to identify. So here's a plot of the uh, apparent brightness of the star versus time, and you see it goes up to a, quickly to a maximum and then slowly comes down, back up again, in sort of a sawtooth arrangement. Uh, the period to uh, uh, length of time it takes to go through one period uh, for this particular star was 5.4 days. This particular star, in fact, is the most famous of the uh, of these kind of stars, uh, which are called Cepheid variables, named after this star in the constellation Cepheus. And uh, this star was, uh, in fact, uh, first discovered, naturally enough, by John Goodrick. Uh, Cepheids are very luminous stars, and uh, Levitt was able to identify many of them, including about two dozen of them, in the small Magellanic Cloud. Then she made an interesting uh, key discovery. She noticed that when she plotted the brightness of these Magellanic Cloud uh, stars, the brightness, against their period, that all the points lay on a single curve. Uh, no such correlation uh, was noted for uh, Cepheids in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, and indeed uh, one wouldn't, wouldn't have been expected since all these stars uh, occur at a variety of different distances and thus their, uh, the distance correction for their brightness uh, w would be very different. But the uh, Small Magellanic Crowd Cepheids are all at nearly the same distance and therefore would have about the same distance correction. So Levitt reasoned that Cepheid variables broadcast their in intrinsic brightness by the frequency of their light curve. That, she said, is what this 
a plot is telling you. Well, what am I saying? A an analogy uh, 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 may help. Let's suppose that uh, there is no standard uh, wattage for uh, beacons in lighthouses. Some uh, lighthouses use, say, 10 kilowatt bulbs, and some use 50 kilowatt bulbs, and so on. Not knowing the wattage, a ship at sea can't use the brightness of the light to determine the distance to the lighthouse. But suppose, by some kind of prior agreement, the 10 kilowatt beacons rotate at 10 revolutions a minute, and the 50 kilowatt beacons rotate five times faster. By announcing their intrinsic brightness by their rotation frequency, the lighthouses now become useful standard candles. Well, Cepheid stars behave just in this way. That's what that's the true meaning of this curve. Henrietta Leavitt had found the magic standard candle. As they stay, as they say in the uh, credit card commercials, the cost was 25 cents an hour. The value priceless. Uh, this sparked a lot of interest in Cepheid variables, and soon uh, these kind of stars, bright enough to be seen in more distant uh, star clouds, were found, and within a few years Edwin Hubble, uh, American astronomer, had measured Cepheid variables in over two dozen of these uh, other uh, nebulae, and he was able to show on that basis that they were several million light years away, hundreds of times more distant than anything discovered in the Milky Way. So they were indeed independent galaxies. And astronomers were then on their way to a journey among these galaxies that would take them back out in space and also in time. But you look, when you look back in space, you're looking also back in time. Back in time by uh, 13 billion years to the, uh, to the birth of our universe. Let's take a look at some, uh, some of these galaxies. Naked eye astronomers can easily see, if you're in the southern hemisphere, the Magellanic Clouds. They cover a huge area in the sky, about 30 degrees. They're a very impressive sight in the uh, southern sky, and anyone who's seen them can testify to that. Uh, this photograph doesn't uh, do them justice. Uh, but these are uh, so-called dwarf, dwarf galaxies. They're very puny compared to the Milky Way and uh, to our largest, our, our nearest, a large uh, sister galaxy, the Andromeda Galaxy, which is shown here. Uh, the Andromeda Galaxy is just visible as a smudge in the sky with a, uh, unaided eyes, if they're young, uh, sharp eyes or uh, more easily with binoculars, you can see this, this bright central part of the Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, and the Andromeda Galaxy is two and a half million uh, light years away. Uh, this last frame is uh, possibly the most astonishing picture ever taken of a small piece of the sky. It's a piece of sky about the size of a pinky viewed from a hundred feet away. And it was chosen because it ha just happens to have no foreground stars in our galaxy. So all these uh, uh, dots of light in this uh, picture are galaxies. There are no individual stars. Just like you, astronomers nowadays have traded in their photographic film for uh, new uh, digital cameras. And this is a digital image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And it's been 11 days collecting and superimposing over 400 individual images of these very dim galaxies. This is the deepest visible light image of the universe that has ever been taken. Light left these galaxies about 10 billion years ago, at a time when the universe was only a tenth of its uh, present size and age. This is what's called a galaxy supercluster. Looked at carefully, there are nearly 10,000 galaxies in this tiny patch of sky. And their intensity is about 10 billion times fainter than can be seen with the naked eye. Well, the Hubble uh, Space Telescope has a collection of several special purpose uh, cameras. And last year, the uh, camera that took this picture had an electrical malfunction and, and is presently out of action. This is a big loss, uh, which is supposed to be corrected sometime this year when the space shuttle is supposed to send a crew to service the Hubble Space Telescope. Maybe this will happen, maybe not. 
NASA has a lot of conflicting uh, priorities, and uh, I think, unfortunately, many of them are not scientific. Well, I can't leave the subject of distance measurement without emphasizing that scientists continually uh, revise and improve their methods. So let's compare these early distance uh, determinations uh, that we just discussed with the current state of the art. Eratosthenes got the distance to the moon to within about 30%. Uh, Today, this distance is best measured directly in light seconds by timing the reflection of a laser beam sent from the Earth that bounces from a mirror left on the moon's surface almost 40 years ago by Apollo 11 astronauts. Uh, the moon's orbit is not circular, so this, the distance varies by about 10%, and I quote here just the average value, but all these, these are all significant figures. The actual distance uh, is measured so accurately that we can now, we're now sure that the Earth, uh, that the moon is spiraling away from the Earth uh, at uh, a rate of about one and a half inches per year. That's how carefully we can uh, establish that distance. Well, Bessel only claimed that his parallax measurements of stars were good to 10%, and so they were. Nowadays, uh, uh, his major limitation, which was the twinkling of the star image due to atmospheric density uh, fluctuations, is overcome by making measurements from space. Uh, in the early 1990s, uh, uh, a European satellite uh, called Hipparchos spent four years in orbit and measured the parallax for about a million stars out to a distance of about 500 light years with this kind of accuracy, about a quarter of a degree. Among those stars were over 200 of these special Cepheid variable stars, which greatly then helped to improve their calibration as standard candles. Again, you can see this bootstrap system in operation. You improve short distance measurements, then use them to improve longer ones. Well, Hubble's initial estimate for the nearest galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, was uh, off by uh, a factor of two and a half. It turns out that there are two kinds of Cepheid stars, dim ones that are seen plentifully in our galaxy and rarer, brighter ones that uh, are the only kind seen in the uh, distant galaxies. And it took about 20 years to straighten uh, all this out. But a few years ago, the Space Telescope, named after Hubble, of course, uh, measured the distance of uh, Cepheid variables as far away as the Virgo cluster, 60 million light years away. Okay, well, back to the eclipse. I hope we have a good viewing on Wednesday evening. Um, we'll meet at about 8.30 at, at, in the back of the range by the water station that's in front of the South Clubhouse uh, parking lot. That lot will be blockaded so that we don't have uh, to worry about uh, uh, cars driving in with their lights on to spoil our, the, the scene. Phil and Helen will bring a telescope, and I'll bring one as well if I can find uh, all my eyepieces. I still haven't located them yet. Uh, any of you that have uh, uh, telescopes, uh, you're certainly invited to bring them. Uh, Art, uh, Sherry, is he in the audience? Yeah. I know he has one if, uh, if he's able to come. Why, uh, please bring your telescope. But binoculars will also be interesting to bring. Uh, the binoculars are fine for uh, viewing the uh, moon during the eclipse. Well, suppose it's cloudy or raining. Well, come anyway, because we're going to have, in that case, a virtual viewing of the eclipse right here in the clubhouse using a couple of laptop uh, planetarium applications. I'll say a bit more about, uh, about uh, those in a moment. Um, but first, are there any questions about the logistics on Wednesday night? Okay, well, an eclipse is a slow-moving event, so we'll also try to view some other objects. Uh, Saturn is in the same part of the sky, very close to the moon, actually, uh, on Wednesday night. 
here's a trivia question. How many planets are there in the solar system? Anyone? You're out of date. Not nine. Eight. That's right. Eight. Can, who can name them, starting with the closest to the sun? Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. Those are the four inner rocky planets. Then, Jupiter, the biggest planet. Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus. These are all big planets. Uh, they're thought to have rocky cores, but they consist mostly of condensed, uh, cold condensed gas. In school we learned that there were nine uh, planets, but last year Pluto was demoted to the status of a large rock. Uh, uh, and that's because uh, many other uh, Pluto-sized objects had been uh, discovered in recent years, and they really don't fit in with uh, the, the, the planets uh, in a very nice way. Saturn is the most uh, spectacular of all the planets because of its uh, rings, which are made up of ice particles. They're sh very showy and there's some elegant uh, physics associated with the uh, position and the spacing of the rings. But they represent only a few millionths of the planet's mass. Saturn has a lot of moons, over 60. One of them is bigger than the planet Mercury. Uh, and the, uh, here this shows uh, the planet and its rings and uh, the Earth to give you a uh, comparative uh, size. Well, we also like to try to gauge interest in other uh, uh, future uh, events. Santa Fe Community College, uh, which is in Gainesville, it's a nice campus, and they uh, have a newly refurbished uh, a uh, million dollar uh, planetarium which runs shows two days a week. Uh, one of the current shows is on black holes. It's called Black Holes, The Other Side of Infinity, uh, which is narrated by Liam Neeson. And it's gotten very good uh, reviews. I haven't seen it and would like to. Uh, every Friday evening, if it's clear, the uh, University of Florida campus in Gainesville uh, has a student observatory uh, open house. Uh, with viewing and uh, I think uh, often a lecture. Uh, if, we, if we go to Gainesville, maybe we could uh, couple that with a star party dinner at the, the Gainesville restaurant. Uh, Janet and I would certainly be, uh, be up for that. For hardcore astronomers, there's the Alachua County uh, uh, Astronomy Club, which meets once a month, usually with a talk. Uh, they have uh, also star parties from time to time. And they loan out the telescopes to take home for their members. So if you're thinking about, uh, particularly thinking about buying a telescope or, God forbid, making a telescope, uh, they have lots of experts uh, who are friendly and, uh, and are helpful. We might have uh, more vocal uh, star parties, with or without a talk, perhaps with an outside speaker, or uh, uh, myself again in a pinch. Uh, I've prepared uh, several talks that I've given at the Institute for Learning and Retirement at uh, Oak Hammock in Gainesville. I often begin by demonstrating software that runs on your computer and turns it into a laptop uh, planetarium. Uh, these, uh, some of these programs are free and they're surprisingly good. And here's some of the other uh, topics that I've prepared talks about. Well, if any of these uh, uh, topics are uh, interesting to you as future activities or if you have other ideas, uh, I'd like to ask that you add your name and an email address to a, the sign-up sheet that's here. And we'll take a look at the level of interest and then uh, get back to you.